This is a 2010 Tiguan that belongs to Jason, senior editor from Jalopnik Magazine. Being an informed car enthusiast, he did plenty of research before getting the car so he knew what he was getting himself into. What's funny is he even wrote an article knowing that he bought a ticking time bomb. And here we are, it doesn't run. So when Jason reached out to me saying he's having a problem with his Tiguan, I thought what a great opportunity to get Paul down to the shop and well, really just help me push the car in. Since we both specialize in VW and Audi content, we both have put out a ton of stuff around the TSI engine. Odds are Jason's probably seen the article about TSI common problems. Or this video about how to replace a TSI timing chain tensioner. Or this video about timing chain stretch. Or this video about timing chain tensioner checking. Or this video about how to time a TSI engine. Or this video about tearing down an engine with bent valves. But probably not this article, which is all about timing chain DIY. The early versions of this engine were prone to timing chain tensioner failures that would allow too much slack in the chain, which would result in the engine losing time bending the valves. Engines have an upper portion called the cylinder head and camshafts that open and close the valves. On the bottom side of our engine, we have a crankshaft that drives a piston up and down in the cylinder bore. To connect these together, you either have a timing belt or a timing chain. If this belt or chain breaks, you potentially bend your valves and they'll look like that. And that brings us to why we are here today. This Tiguan, she don't run. Jason brought this car to a non-VW and Audi specialty shop and they told him he has a hole in his piston. <laughs> Pretty skeptical uh, about that diagnosis. So what Paul and I are gonna do today is dive in, figure out what's going on with it and uh, maybe even fix it. Shame on Jason for not fixing his tensioner. That would be like eating Taco Bell right before a long road trip. That's, That's like just like eating at Taco Bell, period. <laughs> First, we're gonna scan this thing and see what faults we have, if any at all. Have you even tried to start this? No, one key thing, he said it was running, but running rough. If that happens, yeah. don't start it. Don't start cars that you think might have jumped time. If it's That's close. Like trying to start a car. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like trying to start a car that you think is jump time and just to see if it's jump time and then you'll definitely make it jump time. Huh. That's it. Well, none of those scream. Jump time. Jump time. Could be, the, that G28. You no, know that screams to me? Nothing. Hole in the piston. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't, there is no fault that scream hole in the piston, <laughs> unless there was a fault that said hole in the piston. <laughs> I'm curious, at least maybe we'll start with this, is to boroscope the cylinder one to see if there is indeed a hole in the piston. You know, if I wasn't concerned about starting it, because what the problem is, when you start it, it may start, it's that next shut off yeah. where all the slack comes out yeah. of the chain, and then when you go to start it again, is bent valves. So what we're trying to do is avoid having bent valves if we don't already have bent valves. Typically when the chain completely goes, you have more timing related faults than just what we have here. The misfires and the timing, the incorrect correlation fault are all stored at the same time. You can see date, you can see time. Um, so I don't know, I think bore scoping, like if you were taking a smarter diagnostic approach, it would bore, I, scope first. Bore, <laughs> bore scope would not be the yeah. next step, but because we're trying to prevent further damage if there isn't damage already, bore scope I think is a good choice. So coils out, Spark plugs out, camera down the hole. We'll see what we got. Fire in the hole. We had, this car's got about 130,000 miles on it, I think. Um, we don't know what kind of maintenance history this car has. Remember, Jason just got this car, I think it was in March for his wife, so. Mm -hmm. Now, while Paul's getting his bore scope down in the hole, one thing I think, like what I think happened is I think they looked down with a bore scope and saw that the piston had a groove in it. These pistons are actually notched, so you'll always see a groove in it, uh, or there's a hole in it. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like dirt and maybe yeah. contact. I'll and tell you, you what. See right there. That go a little bit. Go down in cylinder two, and I'll grab a screwdriver and see if I can scrape that. Okay, so that little schmutzy stuff moved. Okay, so definitely yeah. not a hole. Typically, when you have a hole in the piston and you scrape it with a screwdriver, it doesn't move. Yeah. It's a safe bet that holes don't move okay. very easily. So I don't see a hole in that piston either. Yeah. No. Well, it. the valve's open. Uh -uh. Wait a minute. Go back up. Slow. Right there. That's the valve. Oh yeah, that is the valve. So the valve's open. I'm wondering if we did in fact have a little Some impact contact. Because what we can look at and see is if the valves of cylinder two are open. Because if cylinder one is open, 
So when cylinder two is open. That's a no we, bueno. Yeah, we uh. <laughs> Where's the screen? Oh, I believe we have a number two valve open. Con There's a kind of the half moon that comes in there. That's the valve open. Yep. So one and two both have valves at least partially open, which means yeah, that means we we have contact. We, we have some. It's a little hard to see, <laughs> but if you look at the top yeah, of the screen, it's no light. Right there. Watch right there. You see it? Light. Light. No light. Okay, I would say that probably confirms that we have two cylinders with intake valves open at the same time, which uh, an efficiently running engine that does not Let me see if we make. Whether there's two cylinders, vent valves, four cylinders with vent valves makes no difference at all. The repair is going to end up being the same. So we have the floor jack up underneath the engine with a block of wood and just a little bit of pressure. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna take some weight off of our engine mount so that we can take the engine mount out of the car and get to that upper timing chain cover. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let him do all the work. And then when he's done, I'm gonna be like, I know all the measurements. <laughs> <laughs> and then I come in and say, swoop in with the knowledge. I know things. Like I'm knowing stuff, man. <laughs> right, so get your tiny cover out the way. It's missing the top. <laughs> We've located the problem. Okay. Where is it? It's gone. Normally, right here is actually um, a piece of plastic a or guide. composite a plastic guide, guide that prevents the chain from hitting the, uh, the uh. cam ladder here, but it's gone. Oh, I found it. It's actually down here back behind the exhaust cam. Uh, Paul, have you ever seen that before? I've never seen that before. We were gonna, as part of this, show you a option for measurement to check it. And the measurement would be from here to here, roughly. And since it's not there, this measurement's not gonna be accurate. So uh, this is a weird failure and it, it may not have even jumped actual time. It may have just broken that guide and actually allowed too much slack on a chain. So, so we might not be dealing with a timing chain tensioner failure as much as just that piece of plastic that broke. However, ultimately it doesn't matter. The repair is going to be, is going to be the same. Just something pretty cool that I've never seen before. One thing we're gonna do also while we're in here to see if Jason was riding with the angels indeed with his tensioner, we're gonna pull this plug, the inspection plug to see if we can check to see if he has the old tensioner. So pretty easy to do because we have all this other stuff apart and the engine mount's not there, is you can see that black plug down there. So you can just pry it out with a screwdriver. Pop it like it was hot. Normally when you're checking this, you would use a mirror like this, an inspection mirror, but because uh, we don't have to and we can actually show you a little bit more accurate with this boroscope and we have it anyway to see what we can see. Okay, look at that beautiful shot. So you can see that band, that metal band is the way you know you have the old one Right up there, you can see those serrated edge there, and that thing will pop out and allow that tensioner to push back when it loses enough oil pressure. Not to mention, look at how far out that already is. So what Charles is doing right now is he's rolling it over to top dead center. He's going to get the lower crank gear, the timing mark lined up, and then he's going to get the upper cam gears both here to where we can, it doesn't turn anymore. We're not gonna be able to turn it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all she's got. What happened? It, uh, I can't turn it the, any further. The valve is touching. The valve's hitting the piston. It is touching the piston because it's off time. So right. we can't roll over. We already <laughs> rolled over as much as we possibly can. <laughs> and wah, wah, wah. All right, so we confirmed that we have some bent valves. We pulled the upper timing cover and found that, uh, that guide not there. Let's call the owner of this vehicle and break the news to him. Hey, it's Charles. Hey, Charles. How's it going today, man? Uh, you know, usual stuff, trying to get the kid to do school crap and jalopnik writing, all that stuff. You should try and get him to do some jalopnik writing for you. I've tried, believe me. His spelling is a little worse than mine, but <laughs> I'm not giving up. That's still a good idea. All right, so we got the TIG wand. We have found some interesting things, some things that Paul and I have actually never ran into. Uh, and I got some good news and some news that you probably were expecting to hear. Um, okay. We do have a timing circuit issue. 
we yeah. confirmed we have bent valves for cylinder one and cylinder two. There's, okay. a, there's a guide in the timing circuit that's actually broken and laying in the cylinder head, which is kind of neat because uh, we've never seen it before. It, it doesn't change what, what the car actually needs. So right. the retail to pay a shop on this, uh, you're looking anywhere between like $4,000 and $4,500. That's gonna be a new <laughs> cylinder head. That's going to be all new valves and, and labor and kind of all the accessory parts on it. Um, right. Assuming that when we're in there, we don't find anything else. We did not pull the cylinder head or anything like that. But what we did do is we did bore scope your cylinder walls and down in the spark plug wells and everything. And we saw no damage to the piston. So I believe, okay. I believe the shop that thought they saw a hole in the piston was just seeing the recesses uh, in, in the piston that right. are built in there. So we're right. good. We're good there. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's not the eleven thousand dollars for a new engine that you were quoted. Uh, oh, thank God. Yeah, but it's also not like clear the clear the light and blow blow the faults out and, and let the car go. Yeah, yeah, okay. So well, that's uh, a hell of a lot better than yeah, eleven grand. Yeah, totally. So what we're gonna do? We're gonna get the parts parts on the way, and um, yeah, we'll go from there, I guess. While I was waiting for Paul to grab the parts, I went ahead and pulled the bearing ladder for the camshafts off and the front support bracket for the cams. The reason that I wanted to do that is oftentimes the little screen inside that front support will come out of the support and get clogged in the head. If that happens, it can starve the backside of the cylinder head for oil and can actually damage the back cam journals, especially on the intake cam, but it can happen on either one. Luckily, we look pretty good on here and I was able to find that screen so we should be good to go as planned. We just gotta wait for a couple of parts. Parts are here. Whenever you're doing a job like this, especially big ones, but even with normal small jobs, it's best to lay out all your parts in front of you uh, in one place to make sure you have everything you need. That way you don't get the car halfway apart and then find out you're missing something, something's wrong, uh, or, or just something is damaged in some way. So we're gonna lay out all these parts, make sure we have what we need before we completely gut this thing apart. So the problem with this, uh, this particular job of taking a head off a car is it's kind of a one man job. So we're gonna do kind of a wrestling. That's why I'm doing YouTube. That's, why, he, that's why he's doing YouTube Ooh. while I'm working. And we're <laughs> gonna do a wrestling tag team situation where- uh, I did get some extra jello for that wrestling though. Oh yeah. When you're, when you're tired, tag him in. It's gonna be awkward with the jello wrestling. Yeah. How's it going, man? Uh, pretty good. Hey, will you grab that thing over there? Oh yeah. So I'm just gonna go ahead and finish uh, doing the hard part here and getting this manifold off. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, we can keep on working. Verify those valves are bent. Open and open. There shouldn't be any open. Open, open, open. Oh. Are they all? They're all. Oh, yes. All four open. All right. <laughs> These are the dividers that go in between here. These are for airflow. And usually they get pretty gunked up and gross. So you wanna get them clean before you put them back in. As you can see, these are kind of carbony. This one looks pretty fancy. I don't know why that one single cylinder is okay. It's probably had a stuck open injector. <laughs> <laughs> and we're opening our head. Comes with all of these goodies. And, and a fancy new used remanufactured head. Hey, quick tip, if you get one of these, and the part number ends in X, that means it's remanufactured and there's probably a core charge. Don't tear up the bag and don't tear up the box because you gotta bring those back too. I haven't drained the oil, I haven't drained the coolant. Let's do the coolant. Yeah, let's do the coolant and then we can do the oil. That. Now, what's fun, we have the uh, coolant reservoir cap on. What's um, fun is when you loosen it. Get this party started. That's Introduce Watch, that air. Nothing's gonna happen. Nothing happens. <laughs> oh, that's some pretty nasty coolant. This is kind of yucky. Ah! Where the hell did that come from? <laughs> oh, that was the manifold. <laughs> this is from the intake manifold. 
Well, uh, this is the trash. This is the trash that makes your car trash. eventually back up and have the drains leak water Jeez. everywhere. Some I'm itching from cleaning that from cleaning out that fender well. Something's got me itching. All right, so this guy is the counter hold wrench to remove our crank pulley. Then hopefully I'm strong enough. I feel like you might be a friend. Yeah. Oh, look at you. You're fancy. I went to the gym once, so. Uh, You're small. All right, so I'm taking this bolt out and then I'm gonna take the pulley off. And the biggest key to this job, if you don't do anything else, is to not do anything until you take the pulley out, take your bolt, put your donut on your bolt, and the bolt goes right back in. This is gonna prevent all your timing business from moving and securing that, that close to catching it. Now it's lost. Though. You can find that special tool at shoptap.com. Good job catching that. Hashtag bro. You dropped it. <laughs> I completely did not expect it to fall that easily. <laughs> this is our engine sling. So we're just putting this on because we need to take the engine mount out to get to the lower timing cover. And this is just a little bit of extra support. I haven't done anything right now. I'm just standing here. I'm, I'm holding this bar up. <laughs> da, 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 da. I'm not doing anything still. Are you, are you doing anything? I'm still not doing anything. So we're gonna be taking this cover off. There's two ways to do it. Almost all the time when you take these covers off, they actually end up getting bent because this metal's so thin. If you take a small like scraper like this that's flexible, you can work your way around the edges and you can actually do a pretty good job of not bending it. But it's really recommended that you just go ahead and replace it anyway. The alternative is if you try to not bend it, but you bent it a little bit and you just didn't notice and then you end up with an oil leak, you're really gonna regret that. All the regrets. A lot of regrets are All gonna happen. There we go. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a very satisfying noise. Mm. Boom! Here we go. This is the cover that came off of the car. You can see where it had, the chain had been rubbing here, here, and up here compared to, compared to what it looks like on the new one. <laughs> Look at that. Whoa. Yeah, you can see this is supposed to funnel the oil away from this area here at the crankshaft as it comes down. That's what that whole purpose of that thing is. So. It's not really doing a very good job with this. This, this, in this area right here is not functioning <laughs> the way it's supposed to. Say a uh, fast oil galley. <laughs> Nothing down here looks bad other than our tensioners pretty much all extended out. Once we get the chain off, we'll probably be able to see where it was rubbing on that, uh, on that cover. But I was gonna rotate it around to TDC, but Paul so kindly reminded me that the pistons are hitting the valves. So uh, we are just gonna take it all off and uh, start from scratch. All right, here is our timing chain tensioner. It sits in the car like this. You'll know it's the old style because it has this band that goes across the top. You can actually see the little retainer pieces kind of jammed into the band. All the teeth, like all the timing chain tension is basically held in by one, two, three, four, sorry, three and a half little teeth. And this is the newer style uh tensioner so gets rid of that little that little guy and so it can't have the band fall off and then allow that the guy to fall out yeah that was worse oh my god oh wow how much coolant does this car take <laughs> that's where all the, we found where all the coolant <laughs> we didn't get enough out of the, out like of the bottom you hose paul you just made a giant mess no it's just uh, a little spooshy i <laughs> it's fine i'm gonna go ahead and say the little work I have done, <laughs> I haven't done very well. <laughs> Lower the expectations, everybody. That's, that's the key. All right, so we're going to take the timing chain off and that's gonna allow us to get both cams easily out of the way. There's the intake. Here is the exhaust. Okay, so this is our intake camshafts. One thing that we've had happen with people who either bought heads from us or something that can happen if your car does jump time like this car is the cam lobe spin. So let's take a look. 
So individually, these lobes are actually pressed onto this camshaft, which means they just tension fit. But what can happen is when the valve contacts the piston, the pressure of this spinning and the contact happening will allow this lobe to spin, meaning it's off time. So what you want to do is make sure all your lobes are in line properly to ensure your car doesn't have a problem with that. Because if you put your cam back in and the lobe is spun, you'll bend the valve again. You can always check that and you, know, you can compare to pictures of intake cams, but generally an easy way to tell would be to make sure a lobe hasn't spun, is if a lobe's gonna spin, it's usually gonna spin only one lobe, not two lobes together evenly. So you wanna make sure that all of your cam lobes for each cylinder, pairing cylinders here, are in line with each other. So you can just kind of spin it around like that and you can see each one of these lobes lines up with each other. Let me uh, get this thing out of your way. That's all right. Actually. I like working in very uncomfortable places. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Second, bro. Uh, that is much heavier than I remember it being when I brought it in here a little while ago. <laughs> We're yanking the ejector out. This is a special tool. It's part of the puller set found exclusively at shopdap.com. Not really exclusively, but I said that. <laughs> all you do is stick it on and then you bam, 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 bam. Just like that. Okay, so now we're looking at head bolts. So this is the head bolt that came out of this Tiguan, and this is the one that's gonna be going back in. There's two different versions depending on the car. Some cars come with these, these are triple squares. Some car comes with these, these are poly drive. If you need a poly drive head bolt tool, we have them, or you should definitely be prepared for needing this if you're taking head bolts out of a car. Most of the cars had the poly drive version. Biggest variation you're gonna see in this is if you look, this one has a washer that's kind of in the head. It's usually stuck in there pretty good. We have the prior it out to to take it off with it and then you can see this version that has the collar built into it the reason why this is relevant is because the new heads one big difference you're going to notice between a new and old one is going to be this plug right here so this has a plug that you can use a screwdriver to turn it out but on the new one it doesn't exist which means you need to put these head bolts in before you put this cam cradle on top of the cams which means you should got to have your head bolt down ahead of time so Part of this problem with this is sometimes people will put this on ahead of time and then uh, plan to tighten everything down and finalize the tightening of the head bolts afterwards. Uh, and then they come to a very unpleasant surprise. Oh, yeah. There we go. All, All right. right. So when I first talked to Jason about this whole issue, he said the shop that talked to him about the problem had said he had a hole in the piston, uh, and so he needed a full engine. And I, I have actually seen piston damage on these, but it's like one out of every 150. So when we got it, we of course bore scoped it. What we saw, and what I'm guessing the shop saw, is these indentations right here, these are actually reliefs cut in the piston. They're supposed to be there. So uh, yeah, no holes. There is a tiny bit of impact, but I'll tell you, out of all the ones that I've seen have impact on the piston, never seen one fail a second time. So I think we'll be uh, just fine putting this right back together. We have no cams in the car. <laughs> you can see we hit a home run. All eight intake valves are bent. Usually you don't get all eight bent. So um, Matt, well done. Nice job, Jason. Okay, so core charges, if you're not familiar, Core charges are something charged on remanufactured parts. So that means that you have to give the old one back to get your core charge back. When you buy a head kit, all parts have a variable core charge. And even sometimes VW changes the price on the cores. Um, I think at one point these heads had $600 cores and then it changed to 350 or something along those lines, depending on the application and stuff like that. So um, you get that core charge back when you bring the old head back, assuming it's in the new box in perfect condition. We know the head's gonna be damaged with the bent valves, but it can't be, the one damage they do not accept is collision damage for core charges. So if you were in a car accident and the front of your cylinder head got smashed to pieces where this was all destroyed, not a valid core. As you can see from this, there's quite a bit of gunk on there that comes off. So soak it uh, in some degreaser, and then you gotta get these things clean. We don't need to worry about cleaning the head at all because we're putting a new cylinder head on, but we do want to get the block and the pistons as clean as we possibly can. The main focus though is making sure that the head gasket surface of the block is clean and dry. We're gonna take this turbo off. We did spray, uh, or Charles did spray this with penetrating oil 
for, so we let it soak for a while and we're gonna pull off the turbo. We don't need to worry about the nuts or the studs in our circumstance because the new head comes with studs and the nuts are also included. And then we can just pull our turbo off. So one question you may have is why are we replacing the entire cylinder head when really the valves being bent are the main issue, but check it out. So when these valves get bent, oftentimes what happens is the valve actually impacts the cylinder head and can distort the cylinder head. So even if we were to put new valves and guides and seals and everything, we'd still have that impact damage on the cylinder head. Not only that, by the time you add up the parts, the labor, possibly time at the machine shop, it's faster and oftentimes cheaper to just go ahead and put another cylinder head on it. Like Charles said, you for sure can get the quickest and easiest by doing a cylinder head. A machine shop would save you money if you went through that process, but it would delay the job by quite a bit. And that's gonna be the biggest difference in if you go down the route of having it repaired versus replacing is going to be time down of the vehicle. Just like we did with the cylinder head mating surface where the head gasket goes, we need to get all the old sealant and any yuck and gunk off of the surface for the timing cover because if that leaks, it is a super pain in the butt to replace. So you need to do a good job cleaning up here. What I am making sure though is I don't wanna get any sealant down here, down in this hole, cause that'll go right into the oil pan. And I don't necessarily wanna pull the oil pan off if I don't have to. We are going to start working on our timing stuff. And if you're just doing the timing chain, it's important to make sure you keep everything neat, organized, and not really mess around too much. But we're replacing the balance shaft and the timing chain. So it doesn't really matter what we do here. Some of these, you can actually loop the oil pump chain up and over this lower crankshaft gear. Sometimes you can't. Usually it's easier to put it all on and have that fall out. We'll pull this crank gear off. Now the biggest thing is you got to make sure you get this put on right. This right here, this tiny little flat spot that you can barely see <laughs> is the keyway that lines up the crankshaft gear with the crankshaft itself. And what happens is if you don't get this on perfectly, or like I mentioned before, if you don't get that donut on right when you take the pulley off, you can end up crushing that keyway and you'll end up with the crank gear to the crank shaft out of time and you can end up with either a check engine light for a timing error or worse, another set of bent valves. So we're replacing the studs on the turbocharger that go to the downpipe. And if you don't have a stud removal or install tool, a really super quick and easy way to install or remove studs is to run two nuts onto the stud. Then what you can do is tighten the two nuts together. Then when we install the stud, we use the outer one and tighten the stud down. And if you were loosening it, you would loosen it on the inner one. We'll just run this in and our studs are all installed and fresh. Well, we got the cylinder head as prepared as we're going to get it before putting it in the car. We got our turbocharger on, the studs on for the turbocharger as well. Uh, really all we gotta do is lift it up and over, set it carefully into place, and then we can go ahead and bolt it down. This part right here and as well as coming out is probably the only difference really on a Tiguan versus anything else because the engine is so much lower in the Tiguan, you gotta really go up, over, and down where the GTIs and Passats, I think it's a little easier, but with a helping set of hands, uh, we can do it no problem. Three, two, one, go. We should be pretty we're on. Much. That's it. It's kind of anticlimactic. Get, get a head bolt and uh, yeah. whenever you're tightening a head down, you will wanna make sure you follow the manual that's gonna have a tightening order. It's gonna tell you usually some sort of diagonal pattern uh, and a torque spec. So you will wanna make sure you follow that to a T and uh, we're gonna tighten our head bolt down. This is our old manifold. We're gonna swap everything over for the new intake manifold, which is the updated version. This, they have leaks coming from this portion right here. You have, get P2015 codes, sometimes vacuum leaks, whatever. This extra part has an updated vacuum valve here that has a nipple here. This is not existent on the old one. You can see it's just kind of a cap. A lot of people wonder what they do with this. And sometimes if people put the hoses in the wrong place, it can actually cause faults. So this has a kit, an install kit that we have available that has an extra vacuum pipe 
with a filter at the end of it that you bolt to the top of the valve cover and it allows you uh, to put that there because this just vents the atmosphere. So what we're looking at here is the balance shaft chain and this is going to be the setup. So this is the tensioner that bolts into the back, which we still have to deal with. And then here are your guides. This guide is different depending on the vehicle. So there is no way to tell when you're doing these, which one you have in your car without the VIN number. So that's why a lot of our kits always require VIN numbers because this one varies by VIN. And you'll see if, if we can get a shot of this, the bolt holes actually don't line up physically. So these are not interchangeable, even though they look almost identical, when you put them over top of each other, you can see the bolt holes are different. And this one is slightly shorter in terms of the bolt hole than this lower one. This is a tensioner bolt that you have that you're gonna replace while doing your timing thing. Do you have hydraulics in here? There's also a spring, so you can pump this up or you can kind of dunk it in oil and then you can pump it up by squeezing it in and out until you see no more air coming out. As you can see, you can see air bubbles coming out. No more air, we've pumped it up. I went ahead and put the sealant on the cam bridge using the anaerobic sealant, making sure that you get it only where it's supposed to go and none in the bearing journals. Then we'll take this part carefully, gently flip it over and set it into place. And remember these are one time use bolts. So you wanna make sure you replace them when you do this job. So because we took the manifold off and we put a new cylinder head on, we are having to reseal the injectors. This is actually a pretty good opportunity to put new injectors in. If you have the budget for it, it's a good expenditure while, uh, while you have it all apart. Plus you, um, you won't have to buy the injector kits because most injectors come with the seals already on them. But we're just gonna reseal these guys here and clean them up put new seals and we'll install them in that new cylinder head. Okay, so Charles actually finished timing the engine and something that people aren't familiar with or realize is that even professionals oftentimes feel better when somebody else double checks their work before timing an engine. So we're gonna take a look at the timing that he did just to show you kind of the timing marks of what we're looking at. So he actually painted here the timing marks just so that they're easier to see. And you can see one, two, and on the new updated chains, they have links to show you where to connect with. Now for the balance shaft chain, you see that here, there's blue links here and it's gonna be on the timing mark on the crank here. There's a mark here on this balance shaft here with that blue chain or the blue link in the chain and then also on the back side here, which you're not gonna be able to see, which we'll show you a picture of. And that side also has a blue link and a timing mark there. The reason why all this is important is because if you don't properly time your engine, you will, have it off time and potentially if you're off time enough it will bend the valves which is very only a very small amount so you need to make sure everything's 100 percent whenever you're timing an engine out of a lot of the like very delicate operations of this job putting this cover on is probably one of the most critical it needs to be sealed to the block as well as the upper oil pan without hitting your sealant on anything and messing it up so you got to be extra careful there we go all right Ta-da! All right, she's on. When you're putting on this bridge piece that connects the exhaust cam and the intake cam, you may struggle to actually get it on because it needs to go on straight, nice and even. You don't want it to go on cockeyed. You also don't want to have to force it. But if you're struggling to get it on, try and rotate the engine around a little bit. That'll relieve a bit of tension on the cam from the camshafts and help this piece slide on way, way easier. All right, so we have a ton of stuff put on the engine. One note, when you do a new cylinder head, all of the holes in this cam ladder cam cover are actually not threaded. So when you install your PCV valve, you have to cut the threads inside the cover. Luckily, the bolts are designed so that they will cut threads when you do it. You just gotta be a little bit careful and make sure you don't really send it home, but that's kind of how you do it. As we start to round home, we got the big boy bolt, we got a torque. So getting the counter hold tool, getting the big torque wrench. This gets torqued to like something crazy. I think it's 150 Newton meters plus another 90 degrees. Probably a good idea to phone a friend to hold your tool for you while you tighten this. Colin Regis. So this is Jason. He is the owner of this vehicle. He works for Jalopnik. He's an editor there. 
And he wrote an article, if you're not familiar, we will link to it, talking all about time and chain tensioner stuff. Uh, and, and time bombs. And time the bombs. time bomb I bought that I <laughs> that couldn't possibly hurt me because somehow I know better. I found it interesting, you know, when Charles reached out to me about the project, you know, I've read the article right. to get a feel for like, okay, what level of awareness, you know, whatever. Well, the, the, the shameful part is I have no excuse. Like I came into this, I knew full well how bad it could go. Right. Absolutely, no question. I did the research, I knew full well, and then I did it anyway, riding on just hope. Because- yeah. Was your general perception is like, okay, this could happen. No, I knew it would, okay. but I had, but because I'm, an idiot in a variety of ways, but yeah, one well, way I'm an idiot. Maybe an optimist. Yes. Well, okay, an optimist. We'll call you glass half full kind of guy. Yeah, I figured I would have time, and I even scheduled like time in my head. Like mm -hmm. I'll do it by this time. Mm -hmm. It's been it's been going like 150 thousand miles. Like it's not gonna fail. Mm -hmm. Like right then. And my wife really loved the car. Mm -hmm. Like she got and she so like rationally, no, I probably rationally I would have walked away. But she loved the car, and I would be a colossal hypocrite if I were to tell her you can't have a car for a rational reason because I have never bought a car. Right. Every car you own stupid, are weird stupid and yes. interesting, unique, but right. don't I make any them. sense. Right. right, but no rational person would do it, so who the hell would I be to say, no, you can't buy yeah. it because it has this little flaw. Right. That would be crazy. So I went in thinking, I know what the problem is. I'll just take care of it soon. And then like the time came for soon, came and went, mm -hmm. and I had my friend who said he would Life help happens, me. whatever. And then... Yeah. Oftentimes, I think a lot of shops sell customers used engines, yeah. which you know we talked about is so bad yeah. because unless the engine is actually damaged, you still really need new chains. You're just doing, yeah, it's just putting off, you just right. get another unknown right. deadline. You have, well, and even worse because you just spent, let's say, five grand putting an engine in the car yeah. and you could have just spent a little bit extra right. of that huge sum and then actually have it be right and have it be a, a solid vehicle, which this vehicle after we're done well, that's, could be. That's why I'm so thankful I was able to get a hold of you guys because you can actually see that it's, it's a it is a fixable problem. I was actively surprised when I heard the engine, and I did the thing where I replaced the, I replaced the cam sensor uh -huh. and the cup, which I knew, rash, like a part of my brain knew it's not that you're hope. just right. killed. But I had to do it just to, I don't know why. So I felt like I wasn't doing nothing. And then of course it happened and uh, yeah, it still stings though. Okay, so we have everything buttoned up. We're about to start the car, but before we do so, we have disconnected the coils and we're gonna crank the car to allow the oil pressure to pump up and get into all the systems before we start the car and have the RPM raise. And in three, two, one, crank. Yeah. Not today, Junior. Let's grab that jump box. <laughs> and three, two, one. Right now we got to hook those ignition coils back up and we're gonna do the for real fire this time Let's try that again three two one uh, yeah. Sounds good, bro good look at our bubble action got some Cool bubbling over there Ooh. Oh, listen to that. That sounds good. Sounds really sounds good all right, so we did some leak checks. We checked as much stuff as we could. Now I'm gonna go take it on a quick test drive and be sure everything's straight with that. Bring it back in, double check the fluids, and then it's time for Jason to get on out of here. All right, so test drive is awesome. We rechecked all the fluids, double check for leaks. Everything looks perfect. Jason, dude, I think you're good to go. Oh, I'm uh, so relieved. You have yeah. no idea. Of course, big ups to ShopDap and Paul for all the amazing contributions in both parts and help and like having a good time. Uh, also, I'm going to plug our podcast. So yeah, check out Cars with Cocktails podcast where Paul and I and Jason joins us for one as well. Link down in the description. Also... More importantly, I'll put links to all the parts that we used on this job here today down in the description as well, and link to Paul and Jalopnik. That's enough rambling for me. With that, we are out. Have an awesome day, and we will talk to you guys again next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.